guys, it's Carrie from Red Curtain Addict, and I'm so excited to see you all tonight for a Behind the Curtain episode where we meet with incredible artists, go behind the scenes, see exclusive concerts, and interact with other art enthusiasts. So over the past five weeks, we've met amazing artists from Broadway leads to ballerinas to jazz drummers who is incredible in their own rights. But now I want to go a little bit deeper behind that curtain. And I'm talking about the artist behind the artist, meaning choreographers or composers or even opera coaches. So to kick us off on this new series of Behind the Curtain, meeting the artist behind the artists, I am excited to welcome on Ronnie Michael Greenberg, who is a pianist and also an opera coach. He has played with incredible artists around the world. He has performed on many amazing stages, and he has performed with the San Francisco Ballet on the stage during one of their opening night galas, and is currently on the staff of the San Francisco Opera as an opera coach. So I'm excited to learn what does it mean to be an opera coach? Is it the same as a vocal coach or is it different? And also we're gonna see a little peek into one of his performances that he recorded just for us and find out about a secret hidden box that not a lot of people know about that you'll find on the San Francisco opera stages and a lot of opera stages around the world. So before I welcome him on, let's take a peek at one of his previous performances just to give you a little sneak peek of Ronnie. Let's see it. Music for the soul. I always love seeing Ronnie play, and I'm excited to welcome Ronnie. Hi, Ronnie. Hey, Carrie. How's it going? It's good. How are you doing? Very well. It's good to see you, and thank you so much for inviting me on the on your series. Oh my gosh, it's so good to have you. I it's great to see you too. It's it's been a while, but I love this background, this bright colors into your studio. <laughs> yeah, we tr we try to keep it very vibrant here in the apartment as much as possible. Absolutely. I'm sure it's inspirational for some of your music that you make at home, huh? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> That's so cool. Well, Ronnie, you are in San Francisco currently, but you're from Montreal. I actually want to get started and kind of hear about your journey of what took you to San Francisco. How did you get started there? So I left Montreal when I was 17 years old to study in the U.S., and I've basically been here ever since. Wow. And before I was in San Francisco, I was in New York City. So I moved from New York to San Francisco five years ago to join the Merla Opera program. Awesome. And for all those that aren't familiar, you know, when I moved to San Francisco, I wasn't really familiar with Merla. What is that for all those that don't know? So the Merla Opera program is a world-class opera training program that takes place here in San Francisco every summer. It's usually around three months long intensive coachings, lessons, master classes, performances. It's really an opportunity for young artists to get a full picture of what it's like to be working professionally in the opera industry. And I was so grateful to be given that opportunity, which has led me to where I am today. Yeah, and it's really interesting. So, so you know, this Merla program is for opera students and you think Naturally, you are a singer, but you're not. And so what, what kind of, what did you do during this program around piano? Right, so the program has, of course, the majority of the, the people, participants are singers. I think there are about 24 singers. And wow. then there were five pianists. And then uh, 
almost every year now they've been having also a stage director. So they've been really varying it up and offering training for the different areas uh, in the opera fields. As a pianist, we are learning what it's like to be inside of an opera house. Before coming here, I had worked at school uh, for independent companies, but I'd never worked really inside of an opera house and got a glimpse uh, and a very good picture actually of mm -hmm. what it's like to, you know, what what's happening in an opera house. It's, yeah. There's a lot of things going on. So it really gave us uh, a very good idea of, of what to expect when going out into the professional world for That's opera crazy. programs. And teaching you how to collaborate with other musicians, which I want to get to in a little bit around being an opera coach. But this just didn't happen overnight. You actually started as a soloist. And talk to us about that, some of your stu studies that you did previous to that. And then how did you, you know, decide that you wanted to potentially become an opera coach? So, you know, I was trying to think the other day, when was the first time I ever performed or worked with a singer? And I'm finding that I totally forgot about this because I thought I discovered it only in college. But I remember playing on a piano recital when I was, I think I was maybe 12 or 11 years old, and I was performing Sunrise, Sunset. Oh, with, I love that song. Yeah, I know, with a, a, a singer. Uh, and so I don't realize it, but I actually working with singers has been a part of my life before I even can remember. Mm. It became a focus and I realized how passionate I was about it while I was in college. It started off with friends who I had who were singers, who I met in the dorm or on campus, and they would start asking me to come to their voice lessons. As a favor saying, oh, Ronnie, please come. Could you play for my voice yeah. lesson? Could you help me learn this song? And I said, okay. You know, in the beginning I said, why not? And then that just sort of opened a door. I, I loved learning about the voice, about languages and the multifaceted nature of opera. You know, the visual component, the orchestra, the theater was just so much stimulation. And I always, I've always loved that. And I've always needed a lot of stimulation to feel fulfilled. Yeah. And I mean, let's talk about this, you know, like opera is the ultimate stimulation. You know, a lot of people think, oh, opera snooze fest, but it's actually not. It's where all of the arts, you know, dance, music, classical music, uh, performances and instrumentalists and singers, then you have choreography, you have a giant set. So you are, I mean, you pick the right one if you are looking for stimulus. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And so one of the things I had to realize about opera was languages that, you know, if you're going to be an opera coach, you really need to be fluent and, and versatile with languages. Some people are better in other languages than others, but you really need to get that Italian going and yeah. then German and French. And of course, some people go on and learn Russian and Czech. I mean, there's basically opera in every language. And I love that because I basically, you know, I studied French and Italian growing up and Hebrew. So I, I came from a multilingual environment and education. And, and so they just kind of that aspect of it came naturally to me and encouraged me to say, wow, this is this is really this is interesting. That's awesome. And just a caveat to all those that are thinking, oh, gosh, do I have to know all these languages to understand an opera? A lot of times they have these super titles that put it into your language. Um, you know, depending on where you're at. So if you're in these states, it would most likely be in English. So you can see kind of what they're saying up top or even in your, your brochure. Um, so you don't have to know that language. That's one, one thing that I kind of was like, yikes, I don't know Italian. I wish, although I wish I did, which you know, but um, <laughs> for all those that don't know. So I, before we go into what does it mean to be an opera coach? You told us a little bit about the languages, but what does that entail? Um, I hear you actually prepared a special song for our viewers tonight to hear you play. Tell us about this piece. So this is a very famous piece and most likely everyone who's going to be listening to this is going to recognize it. Uh, should I reveal it, what it's called? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so it's the Flight of the Bumblebee.
Oh my gosh. I love that song, Ronnie. And you know, I really didn't realize that this is actually a piece from an opera that's Flight of the Bumblebee, right? Yes, it's an, op it's an opera written by Rimsky-Korsakov. And a lot of people don't know that. In fact, I researched this actually just two weeks ago when I started thinking about, you know, finally learning this piece that I've wanted to play for, for a while. And I actually myself didn't know it was from an opera. Uh, and it's, it's just surprising to, to see, you know, uh, working in opera, how many things are relating to opera without us realizing it in, in the culture. And I think, you know, this was a fun example of that. I love it. I mean, that's so usually when I hear that piece, it's played by a flautist and how quickly it is or piccolo. Right. And I think it's really neat to see you do it as a piano. Oh my gosh, your fingers were moving 100 miles per hour. How does it like I noticed, too, when you were playing, you weren't looking at the music the whole time. You kind of had it under your fingers. How long does it take maybe just specifically for that piece? How long did it take for you to learn it and get it get it going? <laughs> OK, well. And I'm I'm not doing this to brag, but I learned that in three days before right. <laughs> before I learned it this week. Yeah, uh, Are you kidding me. I, I'm done. I'm out. <laughs> uh, you know, it also helps that I I know the piece. It's not something like I've never heard of before, so I, that helps a lot. If it was something that I didn't have any idea of what it sounds like, oh but uh, yeah, it's it, it's one of those pieces that sounds a lot harder than it is to play. Really? Uh, yeah. Interesting, because a lot of people, you know, think and cor correlate if it's fast, it's hard, but it's not always the case, is it? It's not always the case, actually. Uh, you need to have the technique to learn to play fast, but the technique to play slow and stretched out these beautiful long melodies, that's actually the hardest thing to do. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, it's so true. Uh I'm playing the oboe, I would just remember it. fast things were fun, right? Qu quickly, but to have the stamina of your air to continue to flow and to move into the next note and it needed to sound easy, it was a lot harder for me too. So it sounds like it's the same, although you're not, you know, using air, it's harder to continue to like make sure that you continue to captivate your audience and move in the right direction through dynamics and things like that. I did need the music for this one because I only had like a few days I was learning it and I was like, okay, I could use the music, but I'm not looking up at it because I do need to look at those notes <laughs> when I'm playing. Well, on the page. Oh my gosh, I would go cross-eyed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm so excited about this next yeah. portion here because I wanna go behind the curtain and learn about what it means to be an opera coach. You know, we think, we see the opera singers on stage and we just, you know, assume that they kind of like, there may have been some practice obviously and things like that, but it goes deeper where you're doing a one-on-one -on -one with these opera singers. And I just want to know, like, is it just around voice? Are you teaching them voice? Are you teaching them choreography? What does it mean to be an opera coach? That's a very good question. And uh, to me, being an opera coach means you are getting the opera singers prepared for everything they are going to be doing on the stage uh, from the dramatic standpoint of what's going on theatrically and how to demonstrate that and show that you know, through their interpretation of the of the music, and you know within that you have text language, so we can talk about the diction. You know if they're doing something in French or in Italian, and you know there's something that doesn't sound quite French or Italian about it, I can help them to improve that on pronunciation. Uh, but opera is, as we said, it's sort of like a um, culminating art form in, in that it just has everything going on on stage. And there, there are so many things happening other than what they need to sing. Mm -hmm. They might not even sing anything until halfway through the show. So what's really important is that they have an awareness of what's going on around them. Mm -hmm. Singers are focused on learning to sing their high notes, making sure that they're in good voice. Those kinds of things they work on with a voice teacher, with their voice teacher. Uh, with their opera coach, we're working on everything else. So if there are five other singers on stage singing different things uh, while they're singing before and after, I'm going to sing those parts around them while we're coaching. I like to call it a bit like we're, I'm simulating the stage. I'm kind of creating that scenario so that when they get to the stage and rehearsals, you know, they're, they're used to hearing those singers around them. They're all like, oh, I've never heard that line before. What's going on? Right. Uh, 
cues are really important, you know, knowing how to follow a conductor while you're on stage. So I will give them an idea of what they can expect from a conductor who will be the main person they are working with on the interpretation of the piece, the music director. Uh, and then, of course, there's the prompter who's in the box at the front of the stage, who's also going to be waving their hands at them. There's a lot yeah. going on. There's a lot to process for you to, you know, and you're, you're, you have to stay focused on telling a story and being in a character. Um, and that's a lot to, to go through. So I, I actually didn't realize that it was a separation from vocal lessons, um, a vocal coach. I didn't realize it was almost the in-between uh, you come to your, your vocal lessons and then you go to an opera coach that gets you prepared for everything else. And then you go to rehearsals and then you go to the performance. So there's a lot of steps I wasn't even aware of, which is incredible. I like to also think about it as you're, you're kind of helping them, getting them training wheels. You know, they want to try stuff out that, you know, in private and it's very vulnerable to try new things out not not sure how it's going to sound if especially if it's a new role or something new that they're learning singers often have their go-to vocal coach or several of them who they feel comfortable being vulnerable with and so as a vocal coach as a opera coach someone who's collaborating with singers for me from the beginning it's always been crucial to read their body language to to assess where they're at so that when they come into the room and we're working I'm not just thinking of here's what we need to get done, but I can tell, okay, this is the mood they're in and, and really, you know, see where they're at and, and um, level with them and feed off of their energy. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Okay. So I, you mentioned a box and I think this is something like I've always been so curious. So if you haven't heard of or seen it, maybe there's this black box that actually is on the stage um where actually we're going to point to that picture that has the black box um in a minute but when you see this there's a little bitty black box at the front right in front of the orchestra i don't know if you can see this photo it's at the very bottom of the stairs and you see that little black thing and you think like oh is that a speaker like oh is that a this is a part of the stage it's not there's actually someone inside there and i want to kind of like tell us what that is what is that person doing and how do they fit into the, sh the performance, Ronnie? Right. So most people are not aware of the box until they hear about it. And then they can't stop noticing it because they're yeah. like, oh, that they like to tell their friends. That's the prompter box. It becomes this whole thing. Un but until you don't know about it, it's sort of this. And that's the point about it. The job of the prompter in French is souffleur, which means the whisperer because you're not supposed to be known. And in fact, if no one knows the box is there and, and, and that there's a person inside, it means you're doing your job well. The person who is prompting is supposed to be there to uh, be there as a backup, as a support to all the performers on stage during the live performance and giving cues, uh, text and words. If people forget their lines, mm. they, can, they can fall back on us. They can sort of like look down and you know, they can they can give you a sign and you have to be. But there's so many singers and people on stage. Sometimes you have to be really good at knowing who's where, who might need your help. Yeah. And I had I had the uh, honor and privilege of doing my first uh, prompting experience last year at the beginning of the season with Romeo and Juliet at San Francisco Opera, which was just wow. life changing. Yeah, I bet. I mean, is, was there anything that anyone rely on you at that time where you I mean, I'm assuming you have like a, a book or a score with all the lines and you really have to know this opera. You really know you need to have to follow along. You have to be so alert, I'm sure. Um, was there yeah. any moment that people kind of like looked at you or how do you know that you need they need your help, basically? So that's where the art comes into. You have to anticipate. You have to kind of get a feeling of what's going on before it happens. Because if you wait until it happens, then it's a bit too late. And they might have already forgotten it. And then, well, then you can still save them. But the idea is to just really be there and supporting. And every person on stage has, you know, a different relationship with the prompter. Some people like to be given cues uh, regularly, no matter what. Some people don't. And our job is during the process to build a relationship with all of the you know people involved in the production to get a sense of where everyone's at and what people's preferences are mm -hmm. and how well they know their music <laughs> i so when i guess like do let's just say i'm on the opera stage and i do want your help i do prefer prompting 
what is like the prompt to get my prompter to help me out? Is there like a, a wink or like a, <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes it's that look of fear. There's, there's a, <laughs> and you can usually identify that very early on uh -huh. before, they, before they've even started singing. You could tell, okay, they're gonna need the help tonight. But wow. a lot of the time they'll let you know ahead of time. They'll say, hey, you know, I'm having a little rough day, rough, rough night, or you know, could you help me out today? Or they'll, they're, they're usually very good about communicating to you, especially if you've established that rapport and that relationship throughout the rehearsal period. So yeah, they usually, they look down, but what's important is that, uh, and, and they learn to do this on the big stages is that they don't move their head down to look at you but they just use their eyes because from far away, if they're looking out to the audience and they just lower their eyes, yeah. people maybe in the first row can see something, but the vast majority of the hall won't even know that they're looking to the prompter. Ronnie, this is so fascinating to me. I don't know if you guys are like as fascinated as I, but I just literally did not know about this until recently. And so like when they are prompting you, Ronnie, like they are looking in the peripheral and you know that they need you. And at that time, are you stating their lines out loud or? Yes. So, so you need to learn to really project. I mean, you're going to feel like you are calling out from one mountain to another mountain. At first, really? when I started doing it, I, I realized, wow, I really need to just project my voice or the text of whatever it is that they're starting. You always give the first word, maybe the first few words, or sometimes even just the consonant. Like if a word begins with an S or, uh, you know, anything like that, that they can hear. Yeah. I might just do, I might just kind of do the, the consonant before they have to, and I, they don't even need the whole word, just the opening consonant can help. It could be really difficult or challenging when there's no orchestra. So yeah. when the orchestra is playing, you can practically shout at them and no one from the audience will know but you got to be careful and that's where the balance and the you know you get you're not supposed to be heard so you have to know when you can shout when you can give them that that vocal cue uh without being heard by anyone else wow i i have to say that sounds like one of the most stressful jobs ever in a musical world besides like i don't know if you guys have noticed like a page turner I'm sure, Ronnie, you work with some page turners in, in, as well, but that's someone that's sitting next to the pianist and following along the music and turning their pages. But if yeah. the pages stick, it's like the worst nightmare of your life. <laughs> um, yeah. that, that, that's stressful, but I'm just thinking like, there's lots of stress involved, obviously, of course, being the main lead, of course, being a conductor, there's lots of things that people are processing, but to be there and to re have to read body language when no one's really saying I need help or even looking at you, you have to like be such intuitive with all the artists and seeing where you're needed. Oh my gosh, yeah. wow, that's incredible. That, yeah, thankfully there were never any situations that were like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? Things are yeah. really going wrong right now to, the, to that point. Yeah. You know, cause then you really, you know, it could be really, as you said, it's so stressful to be there. You know, you're the closest one to the singers. There's the conductor for sure. And, and, and there are screens of the conductor, there are monitors around that the singers can watch, but the prompter has the closest access. So if there's a problem during a show, there's a lot of responsibility for the prompter. That is which, incredible. Yeah, which is, it, it's, it's nerve wracking, but then again, to be a foot away from them when they are gonna sing that high C or that high note, and to hear that sheer resonance feed away from your face, it's life changing. That's so cool. That's so cool. <laughs> I have one more question before we move on to this. Cause I, there's a lot of other types of performances, right? Like there's Broadway, but there isn't, I haven't seen a black box on Broadway. Why is there one for opera and not one for the stage on Broadway? Do you know that? You know, it's a, it's a good question. I think probably, I mean, one of the things is language. I think just mm. people remember things that, that that's in their own language better. Yeah. Um, of course, if, you speak Italian and you're going to sing in Italian. That's not as this, the same situation, but I think the length of the show, I mean, I think overall Broadway shows, I haven't really done an average, but I, I think they have a reputation for not being, you know, three hours long all, all the right. time. I think maybe they're a little shorter. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I think that's probably the main reason, just the amount of, of material that every, you know, these singers need to know. Yeah. Uh, and the language, I'd say a combination of those two. 
That makes sense. So you guys, next time you go to the opera, see if there's a black box, because if there is, there is someone like Ronnie who is in there prompting all of these incredible artists if they need help by a slight hint of maybe an eye or just a, you know, really amazing. So there's really, that's why I'm so excited about this next chapter behind the curtain is there's really an incredible layer that we don't see, which are the, the artists behind the artist, which is, which is you, Ronnie, which is incredible. I love that. Thank you for like explaining that. Cause I've always been curious. So I appreciate that. <laughs> Absolutely. And it might not be black. Sometimes, oh. uh, sometimes uh, uh, designers and set pr uh, productions uh, choose, they, they like to, to, to color it or to make it a part of the set. They, they, you know, it's not just black. They, they camouflage it with different, you know, mm. designs. Sometimes it's not only just black, but yeah. Oh, interesting. The hidden box. Yeah. Very interesting. And thing, one thing I love about you, Ronnie, you know, they're, they're, you've been an opera coach, you're a solo pianist, you are a prompter in this incredible box that we just <laughs> heard about. Um, and you really are an innovator. You're always, you're an entrepreneur. You're thinking about new ways of sharing music and musical experiences. And you've even played piano at the San Francisco Ballet on one of their galas and worked with dancers, which is incredible. But I want to talk about the series that you've started, um, Taste of Talent. Tell us about that for all those are not, who are not familiar with it. So I created Taste of Talent about two years ago. I was looking to start some kind of concert series that was going to be more than just music, uh, people coming onto a stage and performing. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I just, I thought if I was going to create something, I wanted to do something new. And I, you know, decided to think about other passions that I have. You know, my brother is a chef. And so I love the culinary arts. And when I moved to San Francisco, I fell in love with wine and you know going fine dining just everything increased and and uh, became more intense with with the culinary scene for me when i moved here yeah. uh, and so yeah I, I sort of envisioned well what if we kind of have a, a fully immersive experience with you know not only music uh not only wine and food and, and art but what if we cur curated some events that had a theme kind of connecting all these different art forms into a special evening, you know, where people can experience, you know, caviar, champagne, Russian music yeah. and, uh, you know, and artwork and maybe ballet. Uh, and so I created it two years ago and we're doing a lot of events now virtually, of course, but uh, it's really been an amazing journey. And San Francisco is also a big part of that entrepreneurial spark that that I've discovered myself because it's such a city full of creativity and innovation. And That's I've definitely true. been uh, inspired and motivated by that to, you know, to see what I have inside and, and what else I think I can offer and uh, grow in. I have to agree with you on that. It's a contagious thing that happens in San Francisco where it's all about what are you creating? What are you building? How are you stretching yourself? How are you taking something that you've known before to the next level? And that's what I love about this Taste of Talent series is that there is something incredible about performances in itself, but it's also awakening other senses, which is art and food and wine. And hey, where can you go wrong there? <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I've actually had a chance to go to a few of Ronnie's Taste of Talent experiences. They are amazing. The food is always great. The wine is always great. And and Ronnie does a really great job of pairing wine and having you know someone talk about the wine that is paired with the music. So what you're tasting, if it's a darker wine, you might hear a darker, richer sound from Ronnie's performance with a singer or even just a solo. And I just think that's really, it just kind of, when I'm tasting that I'm also hearing it, I'm seeing it. And so I love this concept, Ronnie. So I definitely recommend you guys to check out Taste of Talent. He has a great Facebook page um, and he's, he's doing a lot of concerts coming up. So speaking of concerts, Ronnie, I have a question for you. You know, we're talking a lot about the opera and the behind the scenes and all those great things. So for those that are maybe not familiar to opera or they're continuing to look for that next opera or considering you know, what should I watch online now that we have a lot of digital streamings that are available to us? And then once the theaters come back open, where should I go and see it? I'm just curious, since you're so into the scene, 
What are a few operas that you recommend us to see? So let's start with people who are completely new to opera. Someone who has never been to an opera before. Um, if you like the Nutcracker, if you like something traditional uh, to do during the holiday season, something that I would highly recommend and something that's very accessible and uh, popular is The Magic Flute by mm -hmm. Mozart. It's, it's a fairy tale. It's, it sort of has this kind of uh, magical quality throughout. The characters are very contrasting and it's usually, it's very family friendly. It's great for all ages, whatever background you come from. It's usually always a win for anyone who sees Magic yeah. Flute. Um, especially, especially when you get like such a, a, a colorful uh, production with it. Yeah, I actually agree with that. I, I reacted because this is actually one of my first operas I saw in San Francisco and oh. I hadn't been to a theater so grand like this. And I said, geez, what is this? I'm hooked. And it was magic <laughs> too. And it's, it has that song. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. I'm not an opera singer, but it's like, oh, 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 oh. That, that song that I'm sure you're familiar with, that's in it. And you get to see this lady just Seeing her heart out, it's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> queen of the you. night, yeah, that's the queen of the night, right? <laughs> exactly. Right, so uh, yeah, Magic Flute's a, a great one. And there's, you know, again, I think it's always nice for people who are new to opera. It's nice when there is something in the opera that they will recognize, something that's kind of famous like that, that they've heard somewhere, uh, you know, in other uh, cultural yeah. avenues. Um, so, and then, you know, another opera that kind of falls under that category is Rigoletto, or if I say it with the American pronunciation, Rigoletto. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite operas by Giuseppe Verdi. And uh, it's, it's a tragic opera, but it, it has this famous uh, theme in, in Act Three that everyone recognizes. And yeah, it's, uh, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great plot and the characters are very contrasting as well. The, the singing is just beautiful, the melodies. And uh, yeah, so I would say uh, Magic Flute, Rigoletto. And then if you're looking for something modern, something kind of not as uh, mainstream uh, and classical. Yeah. I would, and I, you know, I'm in the Bay Area here and I've gotten to uh, work and perform uh, with uh, many of uh, of his works. Jake Heggie is, I'm just a huge fan of him as a composer uh, for songs and for opera equally. He is, you know, one of the leading opera composers today, hands mm -hmm. down. I'd say probably my favorite. Um, and he, his operas have uh, are they they have an eclectic style. So there's something in I think in every one of his operas for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, you you have the operatic style of singing, but it's it's very accessible because it's very uh, based on theater and uh, plot. He's very plot and character driven. It's in English, which you know I think that's always great for someone who's new to yeah. opera to actually go see something that's going to be in a language that they understand without having to do a, a research and reading super titles. So, yeah, so, uh, you know, and I mean, he has many operas to choose from. Uh, yeah. Moby, Moby Dick is one of his uh, famous ones. Uh, most recently he had If If I Were You, which is, I think, an incredible score and is going to be performed many places. Yeah, so, and yeah. he did uh, It's a Wonderful Life. I think it was last Life. Christmas. And so he took one of his favorite stories around the Christmas time and he translated it into an opera, which I thought was interesting, which actually we did an, an interview with Jake because I'm a huge fan of Jake as well. Um, and you can find that at redcurtainatic.com. But it was just very interesting of things that he found parallel with his life that he then wrote into this opera. And he's just so much fun. You know, he thinks about how do I get that new um, audience member interested in opera and how do I cater to that audience in addition to continuing to be something that even opera lovers or enthusiasts who love the classic are also interested in. So I think he just has a really great balance to your point, Ronnie. Great, great, you know, recommendations there. I have one more opera to recommend. Is that Ooh. okay? Yes, do. <laughs> so again, I think this one's um, 
all these operas, I, well, actually, not so much the Rigoletto, but I find even with, with Jake Heggie's style and uh, Magic Flute, Turandot by Puccini. It's a heavy piece. It's really heavy. So I think for someone who likes something that's really over the top, I mean, from the beginning of the opera, and it has the famous Nessun Dorma at the end that ev that everyone knows. So it, it has... So good. Exactly. <laughs> so you will, you will get that in Act 3. But it's, again, incredibly colorful. You know, the, the music is just so beautiful. And Puccini is known for that. But Absolutely. personal, personal favorite. Oh, it's a great one. And actually, this, the photo that we showed earlier from the San Francisco Opera showing that little black box was from Turndot. So it was that image that we got to see some of that vibrancy from the show. And I have to agree, it's one of my favorites. It's actually just a great... It doesn't end all, you know, like a lot of em operas end tragically, but there's actually a, a, a good ending at the end of that. And I appreciate that. And so it's a, it's a good one to watch. <laughs> I was, I was going to say that one and also even Jake Heggie's operas, it's not even so much whether it's tragic or not. There's something about the way they, the operas are delivered that even if it's like dealing with, you know, difficult subject matter yeah. and tragedy, you still leave feeling, wow, like, there's a comfort in, in, in that experience that you just had. And I always find it uplifting, even though it's, you know, there's this humanity that we feel at the end of that opera. I think it's great. Ronnie, you're great. I really appreciate this conversation. It's been so much fun to, to learn about your career and your musical journey and going in behind that scenes or even below the stage where you're as a prompter and, and hearing, <laughs> you know, what kind of operas are interested to you. So for all of you out there, definitely when you look at an opera next time, think about this conversation. Think about all that is in you know goes into these productions because it's grand, it's significant, and it takes a lot of work to be able to put these things on. And I think that's really, it's always good to, to keep in mind when you're watching these shows. So Ronnie, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been so much fun. Thank you, Carrie such a pleasure thank you for inviting me and can't wait to see all the other behind the curtain scenes that you're going to be doing thank you ronnie and for you our viewers tonight if you want to see some of those previous episodes you can check them at reddicurtainaddict.com and we hope to see you next time for behind the curtain have a good night